older we get, the more we look back on our lives and wish we would have done things differently. Our choices not only haunt us, but at times, they can travel with us. Words like shame and guilt attach themselves to the stories our lives are telling. Peter, a follower of Christ, knew this all too well. He was the disciple who dropped everything to follow Jesus, was an eyewitness to miracles that we only dream of experiencing, and was the only disciple to step out of the boat and walk on water, even if only for a few seconds. But then things get messy. The pressure of the crowd causes Peter to experience his own version of shame and guilt. And if we're honest, our lives might just be closer to Peter's life than we care to admit. You're invited into a moment of reset and discovery because the events around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the absolute answer to every longing heart. So may God give us eyes to see. Hello, good morning and welcome everybody. It is a gorgeous day out today and it finally feels like spring. So I hope wherever you're watching from, you're enjoying this lovely sunshine that we're getting. I'm Pastor Hannah and I'll be online with you today. Um, we got some praise team members back today. So I'm excited that in our service, we're gonna have praise music again. And we're also gonna have a couple of hymns, of course and our choir will be singing for us. Uh, and so we got a lovely array of music as well as a sermon from Pastor John that we're gonna hear. And of course, uh, prayer, time for prayer and communion later in the service. So if uh, this is your first time joining us online, uh, feel free to share, uh, first of all, greet each other in the comments, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or on our website. Uh, say hello, and then myself and others watching can comment back to you and say hi and greet you and uh, catch up or however much you want to type, uh, be in the comments talking to each other. And then also you can share prayer requests. And then later in the service, when we have that time for prayer, 
uh, we can all lift up those prayer requests together. So if any of you have prayer requests, make sure to uh, type those out in the comments and we will make note of them and pray together today and continue throughout the week and uh, however long you need, we'll continue those prayer requests. Also, like I said, we're going to have communion later. And so if you would like, you can prepare, you know, a little thing of bread, maybe some toast, whatever you got at home, and uh, some sort of cup, some coffee, some juice. Um, if you really want, you could crack open a bottle of wine, but that's not necessary. Um, but just whatever drink you have and whatever bread, and then later in the service, we can take communion together, uh, which is... Uh, just a testament to how God connects us. Even when we can't physically be in person together, we can still be in community, share that communal time of uh, sharing in the bread and the cup and remembering Jesus's love for us and forgiveness. So now that all that's out of the way, uh, let's look at what we have coming up this next week, starting with we are starting our collecting for the rummage sale. So that'll be the last week in here in April. Um, but if you have donations to bring in, big or small, we are now collecting those in our multi-purpose room. You can bring it in. Uh, if you need help bringing in larger things, let us know. And they have signs all up around the multi-purpose room uh, for like categories, you know, like kids stuff or books or large furniture. So let just bring that in, and uh, like I said, let us know if you need help with the bigger stuff. Otherwise, you can just drop it uh, in the multi-purpose room during the today or during the work week, Monday through Thursday, uh, 9 to 3 p.m. Whenever you can make it, let us know, and if you need outside of that to drop it off. Uh, let's see. Also, next weekend, next Sunday specifically, is our pancake breakfast. So if you're able to make it to church that Sunday, I highly encourage you to do so because uh, we will have pancakes, eggs, sausage, the whole works, you know, coffee and juice. Uh, and it is some good breakfast. So make sure you mark that on your calendars. You can get here before the first service or after or enjoy it after first service, before second service or even after second service. So just make sure you leave yourself some wiggle room around the service that you can get some delicious breakfast. And uh, it looks like we're going to be starting our service now soon. And so let's see what Daniel's talking about in the sanctuary. This wonderful service. Today being the third Sunday after Easter. Wow, that's great. And... Um, I'm very sure that uh, you are going to enjoy the service today with everything that we have and package from the pastoral team and the wonderful uh, choir and the uh, ministers. So today I have here with me Miss Pat. Uh, she has something to say to you all. Thank you. Well, as head of the deacons, uh, the 930 service only has three people doing the deacon service, and we really need to have five. So that means that I need to get you guys to give me six more deacons. And let me tell you, I'm just going to point, one, two, three, no. But being a deacon is a great way to start working in the church and not having to do a lot of things. Well, no, we do. But the greatest thing, the greatest thing is <laughs> we have two people that prepare the, the communion every Sunday. We have a, a person down behind you guys passing out your bulletins, and we have two people out front, well, I want two people out front, to greet you with a smile and a handshake if necessary, just to welcome you in. What's the best thing? coming through that door, having somebody with a smile and saying good morning to you. That's great. Now, the other duties, yes, we set up for the different uh, activities we have, but we do it as a team and we do it as a family. And the really great thing is next week we're going to have baptisms. So our deacons are going to help those people get into their robes, bring them up to the uh, baptism, 
then they're going to go around the other side and welcome them back again after getting all wet with a towel and a smile again. These are some of the things that we do as deacons and it makes everybody feel more like a family. So if you want to become a working part of this church that doesn't, you know, deacons only work one month every three months. So you don't have to be here every Sunday. But John has been preaching love and following Christ, and a deacon does both. So see me or um, Janice or um, Mary Daniels and, um, sure, Jamie uh, after or me and let us know when you want your name on the ballot. Thank you. Okay? All right. Thank you, Pat. As Pat said, uh, you're kind of on a rotating schedule once every three months to, to work or to serve, uh, and you still don't get paid for any of it, just in warm hugs and smiles, being part of the church. We are glad that you're here today on this third Sunday of Easter. Let's greet the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to sing the song, Open Up the Heavens, as our acolytes bring in the light of Christ. Jesus, thank you for today, the beautiful sunshine here in Ohio, and and friends uh, that are back in visiting, Don and Tony, and uh, everyone, Lord, on a prayer list, we keep them in mind, but we're opening up our hearts to you, Lord, to let your love warm us, heal us, and forgive us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you're able to, do you want to stand up, join me in singing the song? Let's open up the heavens. Waited for this day, we gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, and burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're
You're welcome, sir. I think we're missing a keyboard. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> we're going to be singing a thousand hallelujahs.
during our time of Lent, we had talked about who is your one? Who is your one, that one person that's in your life, a friend, a coworker, a family member that you know doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, that hasn't really put faith or understanding God or belief in Jesus Christ as a priority in their life. In fact, maybe they've even totally dismissed it. So I asked you, who is that one person that if they were not in eternity with you, it would grieve you? So I, in discussions with many people, we all seem to have that someone. And we often wonder, how do we bring this issue up? How do we talk with them you know, without making it seem weird or awkward. Well, in that time leading up to to Easter and Resurrection, we had Easter, we've celebrated that, and we began last week with Pastor Hannah talking about how we go out and proclaim this good news. And so the proclamation of Easter continues, and we focus on the sermon series, Who is Your One? And today we look at Go and Tell. Because on Easter morning, the angel said to the women, go, go and tell. They also asked him the question, don't you remember what Jesus told you? And then they remembered. And we talked about that we can't remember something if no one's ever told us, right? Now, I know within couples or between parents and kids, whatever, there's always that conversation. Well, I did tell you. No, you didn't tell me. I don't remember that. I've never heard that before, right? But we know that if someone's never told you something, you can't remember it. And we think back. And if you try to remember something and you just can't quite remember and you're trying to think of a person's name or think of what somebody told you or think what you were going to do, and then it'll just come to you. And so there's times where we, when we remember is critical in our healing, in our faith journey, in our daily life. So to help illustrate this point, I thought I'd bring out the story of intrigue and um, crowds and escape from prison and jealousy and all kinds of other things. You can find all of that right in your Bible, Acts chapter 5. So it's kind of a long scripture, but... Um, Here we have where the disciples in Acts 5 are um, out preaching and teaching about who Jesus Christ is. Now, when we talked on Easter, we were in Luke 24. Acts is written by the same writer of Luke's. And so there's a continuation of that story. So let's turn to Acts chapter 5. We're going to begin with verse 12. Now, many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, And they were all together in Solomon's portico, and none of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Yet more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, great numbers of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. A great number of people would also gather from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. The story of Jesus Christ, this life that the apostles are teaching and preaching about, is attracting people, so much so that people are coming from all over the different towns to see what this is about. The spring game here for OSU had 80,000 people. People came from all over to see what it was about. People here are coming to the apostles. In fact, when they're around the apostles, they are being healed. In fact, they laid them so close that even if Peter's shadow would touch the person, he would be healed. But this, of course, was causing a commotion. So we continue with verse 17. Then the high priest took action, he and all who were with him, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, being filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out, and said, Go, stand in the temple, and tell the people the whole message about this life. Go. Go and tell. Go and tell. So they are released from prison. And to tell about this life in Jesus Christ. 
When they had heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and went on with their teaching. When the high priest and those with him arrived, they called together the council and the whole body of the elders of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the temple police went there, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were perplexed about them, wondering what might be going on. Then someone arrived and announced, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So here we have again the, the folks, sort of the, the good religious leaders that's sort of in control. They don't want anybody getting upset. They're seeing all the crowds coming. People are really following after these teachings about this Jesus Christ. So they're like, you need to stop. In fact, you're not stopping, so we're going to put you in prison. But what does God do? Prison can't hold them. It opens it up, and out they come to begin teaching and telling Verse 26, so then the captain went with the temple police and brought them, but without violence, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than any human authority. We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. We are witnesses. And what does a witness do? A witness will then tell and explain, share. And so is the Holy Spirit that's been given to us as believers. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. So here's somebody that not quite ready to go along with the whole crowd, the leaders, and says, <clears throat> fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400 joined him, but he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and also all who followed him were also scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you might even be found fighting against God. And they were convinced by him. And when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. So there's a lot going on in the story, isn't there? How many of you have been flogged for your witness of Jesus Christ? How many of you have been thrown in jail for teaching about who Jesus is? None. But yet we're so afraid to go out and to talk. But one cannot remember what one has not heard. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are to say, we are to proclaim, we are to witness. In fact, they were beaten after having been thrown in prison and considered it an honor. This is an example of carry your cross. It's a burden you must bear. You must bear your cross. This truly is what a meaning of that phrase. When you suffer specifically for doing the will of God. Reverend Ron Allen reminds us that this 
text by Luke, the story reminds us that our witnessing of who Jesus Christ is in the world will meet resistance. It met resistance then, it it meets resistance now. But we are to go on. Now here, when the disciples said, when the apostles said, we must obey God and not any human authority, what that really means is that human authority are the ways of the old age. Remember the gospel writers that are always talking about the, the, the old age and the new age, the kingdom of God that is coming in. And so we now still participate in the old age when, when, when God's kingdom or God's realm is not fully manifest yet here on earth. So we're still under the ways of, well, jealousy and sin and, and power and empire, of thinking in the old ways. But by obeying God and proclaiming, we, we start to see new opportunities Easter is about a proclamation of a a resurrection to new life and new possibilities greater than we can imagine. Or have we already forgotten that just three Sundays ago? The power that raised Jesus from the dead is still active in our lives and in your life. Who is your one? Who is your one that you need to connect with to help them understand who Jesus Christ is. How will you go about that conversation? Is it someone in your family, your life, a spouse? Maybe it's a friend since childhood, a coworker for 20 years. You share so much, but it's hard to share. Like, you know, I believe in this Jesus Christ that makes a difference in my life. This one that's forgiven me and shown me a new way to live and to be. And to be able to let go of hate and anger and shame. To be able to forgive. To be able to see people differently. It's hard to put into words, but I, I, I sense a peace. A sense of knowing. My life still has some troubles, but I know of someone that's always unconditionally loving me. Who is this one that you could start talking about? In Luke 24, at the time, remember the angel said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus of Nazareth, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the son of man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered. And then they remembered. And when is it that we remember in some troubling times in our life? hard times in our life, or maybe you're just going about your day, and maybe your day's spiraling downward. Things aren't going quite how you, how you like, and you sense a, an anger or frustration or a despair or a loss of hope building, and then you remember, I'm not in this alone, and then you remember, I heard this at church, and then you remember, I read this in my Bible once, and then you remember, because some still voice, something inside you says, you'll be all right. I love you. Trust. And then you remember. In fact, Jesus even said to his disciples, when John the Baptist was wondering, are you Jesus the one that was to come? Jesus told his disciples, he said, go and tell John. Go and tell John what you have seen and heard, that the blind receive their sight, that the lame walk, that the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he who takes no offense at me. Luke, who's writing this this story in Acts, writes this about Jesus back in Luke 7, where Jesus says, go and tell what you are witnessing. The people are being healed, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually, that they're sensing and drinking some water of life that is different than they have experienced before. Go and tell them what you are seeing. The people are being freed from prisons, not only literally, but figuratively. This life in Jesus. Now the Sadducees, the leaders, you see, they were still trying to be in control, and that's like us, right? We're not really sure what's going on. We, we, there's a lot of times we as Christians just don't think God's going to be doing any new thing, and we get so scared to see how God is moving and loving in the world today. 
And that's what the Sadducees were doing here, like, hey, there's too many people being all excited and real healing's happening here. You need to stop because we're the ones, according to the law, according to the tradition, that are being in control. And God sends a messenger, God sends an angel, an instrument, which comes to them, releases them from prison, and says, go and teach. Go back into the temple. Who's in control here? God. God is saying, you go in and teach this good news, because those who were to be doing it are not. Sometimes you see how that works in our life where we want to put God in a box and control and think God's going to act in a certain way. And God's like, "Mm, let me show you. Let me break you out of prison. What instrument of God is maybe in your life where somebody's trying to free you from that figurative prison that you have yourself in in one area of your life? to come in and say, go out and tell, to go out and show. There's something about the gospel that makes prisons ineffective. There's something about the good news of Jesus Christ that makes prisons ineffective that can't even hold the men in there, and somehow, without the Bible explaining it, they're able to be from there back into the temple teaching, and no one is aware of it. Those who are supposed to be holding them captive, holding them in control. And the people come to them and lay the sick so that Peter's shadow might fall on them and heal them. Something about Jesus renders the sin in your life ineffective. If you believe this and you want that resurrection power in your life, how are you making that resurrection power available for others? What are you telling them? What are you showing them? How are you loving them? Now, again, Gamaliel gives us an example of, you know what, not everybody's going that way. Gamaliel was like, you know what, if this is of God, it's not going to fail. And it hasn't failed for thousands of years. There was Joseph of Arimathea, another Pharisee who, who allowed Jesus to be buried in his tomb. One who was looking for God, as it says in Luke looking for the kingdom of God, looking for something different that is happening. You see, we always have to keep looking for something that might be happening beyond what we think we're seeing in front of our eyes. What is God doing in your life? What is God showing you? How are you being asked to be an instrument that can help others break free from the prisons of their lives? I was in discussion with a a young person just, just recently I said, well, have you thought about coming to church? Oh, no, I've never really thought that. I haven't, I haven't been there since I was a little boy. I'm like, well, might be a good idea. We're open on Sundays. You know, it was just kind of as easy as that. Like, well, he didn't have any real reason why he wasn't coming. He just wasn't coming. And nobody invited him to go anywhere. Just not what they do. I don't know. We'll see if he shows up. What are we going and telling? What are we doing? What are we proclaiming? So Easter, we, we kind of celebrate it, but maybe it's easier to talk about Christmas, right? Christmas time, invite people to Christmas. It's, it's warm, it's cozy, little baby Jesus. Everybody loves little baby Jesus, right? I mean, little baby Jesus doesn't really push you to have to confront your sin. Little baby Jesus doesn't really push you to... to uh, well, to, to love your neighbor. You just sing warm, feel-good Christmas carols. We can talk about that with people. Come to Christmas. But you see, if we stay too long with that little baby Jesus and that little Christmas time, we're not really growing in our faith. There needs to be this constant emptying of ourselves and the infilling of Christ in our life which allows us to grow. It's a cycle. It's a universal cycle. It's moving us forward, compelling us forward. It's pointing to something else. It's a cycle of hope and love, and where there's hope, there's love, and where there's love, there's hope. It's what points us 
points us to something too, something new in Revelation 21. John writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them, and he will wipe every tear away from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things, those old age things, have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Something is being made new in our life each day. And if we sense that and believe in that and share that with people, our proclamation of the church is to bring about the kingdom of God. Are we willing to do that or are we fearful of doing it? I'm pretty sure none of us are going to get flogged this week for talking about Jesus Christ. Now, you may face somebody like, Hey, why are you bringing that up? Well, I don't know. Because I love you, I really like you, and this is kind of important to me, and I just thought you might want to know a little bit about it. And, you know, maybe you back off after that point. I'm not saying to pick up your Bible and smack them over the head with it. Right? But there's got to be a way in which you say, you know, this is, this is foundational to who I am. If I say, Jesus Christ, you're my Lord and Savior, I need to proclaim that, not just within the dark confines of my prayer closet. I need to say that out there in the world. And it has to go beyond easy Facebook memes as well. It has to go in how you are living your life, how you are loving people, how you're showing that goodness of Jesus Christ, because you don't know how God is working. How are you showing that? How are you doing that? How are you letting this come in? Go and tell. In Philippians, Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained this or I've already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to, toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward for what lies ahead. That's a resurrection power that brings new life. It's operating in your life, and are you willing to share that and show that for others? Now, there's going to be others who are going to be like, hey, remember what you did. Don't act so good. Who are you to talk to me about Jesus, right? Remember what that? They try to bring up your past as if that defines you. Maybe the devil's whispering on your shoulder, you're not legitimate. You can't talk about that with that person, right? And that shame and guilt and fear comes into our lives. Well, just remind the devil what's going to happen to him when Jesus comes again, right? Victory is already ours. Victory over sin and death is already ours. You have Jesus Christ who loves you in all situations. This is the Jesus Christ who loves you unconditionally. Why is that important to know and to say and to repeat when it seems so obvious? Because when you're down, when you're upset, when you're losing hope, when you think the world is against you, what are you going to do? Lash out and be angry and get frustrated and build the walls? Keep people away? Keep perpetuating the argument? Or are you going to say, you know what, I believe in this Jesus Christ whose resurrection shows me a different way of acting and I can be that light and love right now? Yesterday morning I had somebody cut me off, right? We all have somebody who cuts you off. And I thought, you know what? I don't know what's going on with that guy. He's out driving on a Saturday morning, so am I. I'm just going to let him be him, and I'm going to be me. But I had to remind myself of that, right? I had to remind myself that there's a better way to be in the world. Sometimes we have to do that. And if you don't do that, and you go ahead and act like a fool, 
Guess what? Jesus, I'm sorry. And then you try to find that person. You say, you know what? I'm sorry. I could have acted differently. This is the real life of what this whole story is about. Oftentimes, we, we want to idolize. Oh, let's make it biblical. Let's make it this. Well, in the Bible, people are getting beat up and flogged and thrown into prison and betrayed, and there's jealousy and there's anger. That's the real life that we have to confront as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ and how we go forward and live that out and figure it out. But there's one thing is the same for all of us is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and unifies us and says, go and tell Go and tell that the people are receiving, the blind are receiving their sight. The naked are being clothed. Go and fill the cities with the teachings of who Jesus Christ is. Proclaim it with your love, with your generosity, with your service, with your time, with your talent, with your midway to step up in ministry, to fill gaps in ministry, to see a need in the community and make that happen. That's living the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. When we think about our times of offerings, I there's so many ways in which what we do in this world, what you've given, how you've helped, um, impacts lives that, that we don't even know about. A couple of weeks ago, we had we let the church be used for a fundraiser for um, a lady trying to raise money uh, for her mission trip. In May, we're letting the church be used by another group um, to raise money for their mission trip. And just think about when you've given your money and it's helped pay the electric bill, or the heating bill, or to replace ceiling tiles that leak, or to help pay the custodian to keep the church clean. All that creates a building that's presentable and suitable for the public to be able to come in. And that money that was raised is now going to teach about Jesus Christ or bring some medical aid or some healing to people around the world. Amen, Amen right? I mean, just, we're all doing our part. People hundreds of years ago did their part, which allows us to be where we are today. We're doing our part, which is planting seeds so that the good news of Jesus Christ continues on into the future. Amen.
As we go into our time of prayer, I, I do want to welcome Don and Tony Lacey. They're here today, longtime members, and had to move out of state, and they're back, and they just wanted to make sure the congregation knows they're so appreciative of all the cards and hugs and well wishes that they've had of dealing with their cancer treatments. And it's good to have you, good to see you here physically uh, visiting. So as we are in our time of prayer, we know that some of our our members are having surgery this week. They had surgery last week. There's recovery and physical healing. People that are uh, in the hospital unexpectedly. And so Jesus, we pray for them. We pray for our, our teachers and our students kind of going into this last six weeks of, of school. A lot of testing that's going on. People getting ready for graduations and transitions in life. Lord, we also uh, raise up to you the Roman sale is, is a ministry, Lord, that helps us raise so much money for missions. And so, Lord, make make the word known that we need people's uh, stuff they want to get rid of so that we can sell that. Lord, thank you for the people that are considering volunteering, those that are considering uh, being teachers here for Sunday school. Lord, those that want to serve as deacons and leadership in the church. Lord, thank you for empowering those people who are working and serving out in the community, just being love and light and food and listening, showing compassion to others. Thank you, Lord, so, so very different ways that we all help. You've given us each different gifts and, and ways of relating to different people. I'm so thankful, Lord, there's others out there that can do what I can't do and they're able to be there and be for you, Jesus, that presence in a hurting world. So Lord, today, continue to fill us with love and light, empower us to go out in this world renewed and refreshed to proclaim your love, your goodness to the world. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. I'll be singing, actually will be singing, is Goodness of God. Um, so, you know, as John's been preaching, you know, as Daniel have told us before, don't keep it to yourself. <laughs> Tell everyone about the good news, you know. So with our wonderful and faithful God, I mean, the chorus that you'll be singing with me, it says, and all my life you have been faithful. All, all my life you've been so, so good. So why do we want to keep that goodness to ourselves? <laughs> so make sure you share it with somebody, you know, bring them to church, have a conversation, as John said, you know. So, um, so really listen to the, uh, the lyrics to the song and really sing it out uh, when we get to the chorus with me. Goodness. 
Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. As we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. God in heaven, spring is the time of rebirth. Let our faith grow like the spring plants, flowering and blooming in the love of Jesus Christ. Bless all our congregation, our elders, deacons, pastors, and musicians, and also bless the elements of our Holy Communion, the bread and the wine. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he passed it among the disciples. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took the cup, blessed it, passed it among the disciples, saying, This is my blood shed in the new covenant. Whenever you eat from the bread or drink from this cup, do so until I come again. All are welcome to Holy Communion. I invite you now, for those watching at home or uh, if you're in a space where you can uh, have some bread or something like it and the juice or drink of some sort to, at this time, you know, just hold whatever bread you're using, hold it up, remember how Jesus broke it as you break it and blessed it, giving thanks, explaining that this was his body broken for us. In a similar way, I invite you to lift up your cup and hold it. Remember how Jesus took a cup and blessed it, gave thanks and passed it to his disciples, that this cup is a new promise forged in his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Let us eat, all of us, as we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes back again. Please take communion with me. And please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I give thanks for all of these people uh, who attend our church, whether in person or online. Uh, thank you for this community that supports one another, that prays for one another, and who lifts each other up so we can do the best that we can in our world, in our communities, and our homes and lives. Uh, just doing our best to bring your love to all of your people. God, we pray for healing for those who are injured, for those who are sick. We lift up those who are going through difficult times financially, going through difficult times in uh, their relationships and in their uh, personal lives and their work lives, uh, with friendships. Uh, we just lift up those who are struggling, God, uh, to you, those who are recovering, those who are facing challenges that might not be so evident to others, but uh, are struggles nonetheless. God, may you watch over us all and keep us safe as we go about our weeks and uh, help guide us to that one person who we can share your love with, share the good news of Jesus Christ with, uh, whether it's through a conversation or just how we go about loving each other and showing them that love through our actions, God. Uh, just guide us. And in your son's name, we pray all this. Amen. Let us join back to the sanctuary.
Let's stand and sing our last song here, which is awesome. It's called, Oh, How I Love Jesus. We'll sing one verse. Christ loves you. Have an awesome, God-filled week. Amen. Thank you for being with us online today and worshiping uh, from your homes or from your car or for where, from uh, wherever. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, hopefully in person. If not, then I'll see you here online again. And be prepared because we're doing baptisms next week. Uh, so it should be a really special service, and uh, I can't wait to see you all a week from today. Until then, have a great week, and I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>